Okay, so today we're going to continue from where we stopped. I was, um, I had a word in my mouth before the time was up. And, uh, anyway, we will also come across that in the course of our study. That is next week. When we're going to begin to look at them. Um, Basic fundamental doctrines of Christ. And that is repentance from dead warfare towards God, baptism, Holy Spirit, but water baptism, Holy Spirit, baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment. And then after that, we will face the, the strong meat. We're going to be looking at so we take the milk and then from the milk to the meat. From the meat to the strong meat, and uh, it is the meat that we have been looking at um, for the past two, three weeks now. What prevents the meat from coming? Or what prevents the blessings of God from coming? There are a couple of reasons and a couple of uh, conditions that hinder God's blessing from flowing to us. But today, let's just continue. We will get there. We will definitely get there and um, we will deal with it. The intention is that at the end of these meetings, you will be 100% sure that nothing in your past holds you down. Number two, you will be 100% certain that when you open your mouth to pray, to ask God for anything or to request for anything, you can be rest assured God hears and answers your prayer. You will come to that level of confidence at the end of these <coughs> sessions. Amen. And then again, you will know to exercise authority and the power and dominion that Jesus Christ has given to you. You will learn and know how to exercise it and no longer be struggling. Your word will be yea and amen and it is done. That is what we want to achieve and then you're going to be very effective having understand your calling and your ministry you will begin to be very effective in carrying out your God-given assignment because it is in those areas where God has called you that he has bestowed the grace to do it. And so when you stand in that office doing it, it looks so cheap and so simple and all of that. You do it effortlessly. Okay? All right. So... <clears throat> Just within one, two, three minutes before, let me just do a very short and brief recap. I started yesterday by saying that um, if you're not going to be, if you're going to make a difference, if you are not just going to be among the, uh, the, the crowd, you want to separate yourself from the crowd, if you want to be different, then you must make sure that the foundation of your Christian faith is intact and is very solid. And I say that if you are going to have your foundation solid, you must know the person of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is a person, and I read for you Isaiah 28 that says, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a tribe stone tested, precious, proven, and that anyone that stands on that stone, on that rock, will never be disappointed in your life. And I said that the reason why people get disappointed in life, that is to say your faith is not strong at all. The reason why you start somewhere, you, you start shaking and double-mindedness and all of that is because of lack of understanding of 
what is actually the thing that God wants to do. Because until you understand what God wants to do, you will be doing all the opposite and you will not be on the same page. And I say that the very first and primary reason why God is doing everything that he's doing, the very first thing he wants to do is that he wants to produce Christ in you. So every other thing that he's doing is geared towards accomplishing that goal. Whether he's giving you money, whether he's healing you, whether he's giving you breakthrough and all of that, the end result, what he wants to achieve is to produce Christ's like, Christ likeness in you. If that is not your aim, if that is not your objective, if that's not your aspiration, then you're going to be frustrated before you know what is going on. And that is why when, when the going gets tough, you get discouraged, you get dismayed, and you back out. Because what he wants to achieve in every situation that shows up, when you have trouble, when trouble shows up in your life or difficult situations and all of that, what he wants to do is to use that situation to grow you, to make you. And when he has finished that, that thing that you are looking for, he will bring it. Because if he brings it before he does that, then he's going to fail. You will fail, you will disappoint, you will break down. So what he does is that until he proves you, he will walk on you. He will walk and walk on you. You look at Abraham, you look at Joseph. The Bible says concerning Joseph, when the word of God came and proved him, after proving him, then he released whatever it is. The same thing with Abraham, the same thing with David, the same thing with Isaac, the same thing with everybody, every single one. The disciples of Jesus Christ, the apostles, the same thing. Before he will shower that thing on you, before he will let his grace and his power and the glory and all of that rest on you, he must have to work on you. So God is in the business of working. That is why he said he is the one that is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure, not your pleasure. First, his good pleasure. So when he when he achieves that, he is going to let you have those things. But why, before those things begin to come, he's going to give you the bread and the water and all of that to keep sustaining you until he's done with what he wants you to do. Or oh, until he's done with what he's doing in your life. That is why, first of all, he will take you, he will bless you, he will break you, and then he will give you. Don't forget that process. The essence of everything that God is doing is to produce. Because if at the end of the day, you say, what shall it profit a man? After you have gained this whole world and then you lose your soul. And I say that this is a very wrong teaching and preaching that we have been taught over the years. That's why when you get your, when you go born again, they will tell you, just give your life to Christ and everything will be well and everything will be fine. And then when you give your life to Christ, the next thing they are going to be giving you is the meat and will be forcing meat into your mouth to eat. And that is what has created the disjointed Christians that we have today. Fitness Christians that are only dependent on what they can get. And when that thing that they are looking forward to getting is not available, they get disappointed. They get discouraged. So that is the end result. That is really the basis of everything. If your faith is going to be rooted and grounded in God, then you must have to understand it. You must have to understand that God loves you. And he's not going to do anything bad to you. That what he's doing is to help you. I told you some time ago how ego trains his um, the eaglet. It doesn't come the easy way. When you see an ego high up there in the no other bird can get to that height. No other bird can get to the height where the eagle is. And eagle they don't eat dead food or dead meat. Anything dead you see is they won't touch it. They are very selective and they are trained that way. So that is the reason why God is doing what he's doing. Before he uses a man, he will first of all walk and walk and walk on that man, the man that God uses. So today um, uh, I began to talk about the different um, experiences if you want to get into the very body of Jesus Christ. Because a lot of people, like I said, 95% of the people we see in the church today, and I said not only in the church, I mean also from the pulpit is included, are not born again. 
it might be difficult for you to understand, but just don't worry. And then, and the reason is because of the kind of blessing we get from the prophet. Say after me, say after me. After preaching about open doors and going to, he said, if you want to connect, come out to the pulpit, to the altar, and then you come out, say with me, Jesus, Jesus, come, come into, into my life, my life, and all of that, and the end, you are saved, you are born again, somebody behind you is waiting, you follow the person, you go and sit down there, and then they will talk with you, when you finish your book, the next day you will see the person again, or or oh, the next thing that you start doing is that like, you pick up your phone and start calling the person, why are you in the church? Why are you not in the church? Uh, you know we have our service today. Make sure you call and all of that. You don't tell somebody that is born again that. You don't do it. When you get born again and the life of God enter, you will be the one. You will be the one following the church up. Why is the church not open in the morning? Why are they not holding service by 8 o'clock in the morning? Why is the service not holding by 12 afternoon? Why are we not having church service in the evening? Why are we not having service every day? That's what you'll be doing. That's what you'll be If you have not done that, if it has not happened to you, you are not saved, you are not born again. So that's what we see every day. And we keep deceiving ourselves, thinking that we are doing what we are wasting our time. I'll be playing religion and all of that just to add to the numbers. When a man have an encounter with Jesus Christ, I told you, that's why I began to tell you, the very first thing that you do is that you're born, you get born again, and I told you what it means to be born again. is a change of heart. And your heart cannot be changed and giving a new heart and go on all of that. And you are seeing normal. I give you an example of somebody who has been blind for 20 years and all of a sudden you are born blind from birth. And then all of a sudden you got healed and you receive your sight. Are you going to talk be normal and all of excitement everywhere? You will be shouting and jumping and every, everybody must know that you have received. And you, you will be excited. You want to look at everything because you have never seen human beings the way they are. Because you have never seen a fan. You have never seen AC. You might be hearing about AC and how that it cools and all the but you have never seen it. And then you are going to take attention, take time, looking at it. Look at this one. Look at it. You, you are just overwhelmed. So, you get born again and then you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I told you what the four processes that you get born again, you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get baptized in the, you get baptized in water, get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then you'll be partaker of the communion. And I explained to you what happened at new birth, and I explained to you what happened when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Then the third one, what happened when you get baptized in water? I told you what happened when you get get baptized in water, what it means. And then what happens when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit? Why did God want you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? And why does he want you to continue to take the communion? Because if you don't understand why, this is actually what makes the difference. That is why you can take advantage. That is what makes you very strong. That's what makes you very thick. That's what separates you from an average Christian. When you understand why and how that thing is being done. And so you will be careful. It will no longer be a religion or a tradition. When you come to the communion table, it will no longer be a tradition. But to other people who don't have the understanding, it's a tradition, is a slogan. Now, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I've explained to you what happens at new birth, what God did. And then at uh, water baptism, I've explained to you what happened at water baptism. Now, what happened at the Holy Spirit baptism? When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, if you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, if a man that is born again is not baptized in the Holy Spirit, he is not a member of the body of Christ. He is still disjointed. He is just like a tree. He is just like a branch on a tree that is cut off. He is just like a branch on a tree that is dried up. You don't have that life. You are not a member 
And so the resources of that body will not get to you. You will think you do, but it is not. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, verse 12 and 13. And some people have told us that uh, being God, uh, speaking in tongues is, uh, is, is past. It is it's gone with the apostles. So it is no more relevant in our time. <coughs> For by one spirit, verse 12. For as the body is one and had many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are what? One body, so also is Christ. What is he saying here? Verse 12. For as the body is one, and had many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. As you are looking at me now, I am one body. But this one body of mine, I am one person, one body. But I have how many members, how many parts of the body? different parts of the body and all these different parts of the body are the things that make up this one body so i am still one body but it's made up of different parts and all these different parts are connected to this body the same way is jesus christ jesus is the body of christ and jesus christ is made up of different bodies different parts of the body. You are a part of the body of Christ. I am a part of the body of Christ. You are a part of the body of Christ. All of us here are all parts of that one body. And you cannot be disconnected. So we are connected to that one body. Now look at what makes you connect to that one body. What connects you to that one body, which is Jesus Christ. What makes you vitally connected to the one body of Christ. Look at verse 13. He says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether you be Jews or Gentiles, whether you be born or free and have been all made to do what? To drink into how many spirits? So we have one language that we speak. Let me tell you, in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 11, you know at the part, uh, Tower of Babel, the whole world were one. They were speaking. There was nothing like Hebrew, Yoruba, Hausa. There was nothing like Greek. There was nothing like Hebrew. There was nothing like Aramaic language, all those Arabic words, and all those things are not. They, all the languages came as a result of confusion at the Tower of Babel. And there is no one language that is complete on its own. That was when God gave man a vision and then told them to, to he told, gave man the instruction to go multiply and all of that. They said, no, let's we discover, let us just come together and all. And so, in order to disorganize them and scatter them God gave them different languages and so they now got disconnected so this one now so a group of people are speaking one language and so they understand themselves and so they pulled out from that whole one then another group again who understand themselves pulled out from the main so at the end of the day that one major body is now disconnected into different parts that's why we have one million and one languages and all of that this Member. But at the Holy Spirit baptism at the Pentecost, there is a reunification of that body. That everybody is coming back again under that same one umbrella. One language. At the end of the day, we are going to be speaking one language. And we have one language in the body of Christ. And that language is when we pray in the Spirit. And it is through that language, that's through the spirit that every one of us get connected to the body. So you cannot say that you are not a member of the body if you have drunk from the spirit. But if you don't drink from that spirit, you are not a member, you are not a member, you are not connected. This is what initiates you into the membership of, that is at the end of the day, that's the stamp. And 
if you are not a member of the body of Christ, I want to say this, if you are not a member of the body of Christ because you are not baptized into that body, the power of the Holy Spirit will become a thing of non-existence. You will never, ever know the power of the Holy Spirit. You will never operate in it. You will never have it. The reason is because he said, tarry ye in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And you shall receive the power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. It is at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. That is when you receive that power. So if you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't have that power. You don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. You don't have the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can't have that gift. You can't have that power. You can't operate. And therefore you cannot serve. God, the power is given to you for service. The presence of the Holy Spirit or the presence of God in a man's life is in three phases. One, there is a spirit within. The Bible said that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. Number two, that Holy Spirit that is inside of you is for your own personal work, development. It's for you as a person. The one that is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure in you. The Holy Spirit that is inside of you is for you, not for any other person. Is to develop you, is to build you. As many as are led by the Spirit, the Spirit of God that is inside you is leading you by himself inside of you. It is for your own personal you. The one that is inside of you is not for sharing. It's not for any other person. It's not even me. It is not for me and you. It's building up your most holy faith as you pray in the spirit. It's for you. Then there is another aspect of the spirit of God upon you. That one that is upon you, on you, is meant for service. It's not for your own use. It will not profit you. Hello. Hello. Have you wondered how, why is that somebody can be sick? You can be sick and you are laying hands on the people and they are getting healed. You have not seen it before. Why? Somebody can be suffering from one problem or the other. A minister, maybe a Christian or whatever. But you pray for other people, they get results, but you are own. Because the spirit that is within you is the one that you need to build your faith to receive from God. The one that is on you, the anointing that is on you, is not for you. You can finish preaching. You can finish preaching and things will happen. The next day they will see you. The next minute they will see you in one joint where you are you are getting drunk with uh, liquor and alcohol and all that. They can see you on top of women. They can see you in hotel with women. You can all kinds of life and all of that. You will be behaving big time. The reason is because the Holy Spirit that is inside of you is meant for you to help you cultivate the character of Jesus Christ. To build your own personal faith. The just shall live by his faith. So if you didn't take advantage of the Holy Spirit that is inside of you to develop yourself, to develop strong, strong faith. That's why you may not even have faith to do anything. But that thing that is on you, you can be praying for people and the result will be happening. Things will be happening. But even you, you don't have faith. That's what a lot of people don't know. That is what is confusing a lot of people. Anyway, this is for the school of ministry. I don't want to dwell on it. When we come to the school of ministry, we deal with it. God, that has confused so many people over time. Young Christians and even adults. You shall receive the power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That power of the Holy Spirit is for service. You don't serve yourself, you serve others. It is for service for others. And God forgive you. God have mercy on you. May God have mercy on you. If you have received the Holy Ghost baptism and you don't serve, may God have mercy on you. May God have mercy on you because you are going to answer questions. 
remember the man that was giving one talent, the other one two talent, the other one three talent. What do you think he's talking about? It's a gift, a gift of the Holy Spirit to give it to you for service. So what is it that you have done with this? Nothing. He will answer questions many times. You believe it, you don't believe it, you know it, or you don't know it. Let's just be going. When we get there, you will say, you will know. You will be hearing my voice. The day you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you will be hearing my voice. So that is about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit essentially is to initiate you into the membership of the body of Christ. So that you can now begin to draw from that body. There is a whole lot. I don't want to go there. It's for the school of ministry. We will come, we will come back to this particular First Corinthians 12, 13. And then we will go down all till 27, 28 to the end of it. But it's not for now. So let's go to the next one, which is uh, um, the Holy Communion. Why does God want you to partake of the communion always? I have said it before, and uh, some of you got agitated, got worried, got disappointed. And I said, nobody that is born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, talking in tongues, has eternal life in you. You don't have eternal life. You do not have eternal life. The one that has eternal life is Jesus Christ. And I want to put it this way. If you are working in a company, and the company gives you a car, and they give you a house. Who is the owner of the house? You. It's your house. You are living in the house, but it's not your house. True or false? And you, who is the owner of this car? It is your car, but it is not your car. It is a company's car, but you can use it two, four, seven. In that house, you sleep in that house two, four, seven. You do whatever you want to do. You bring in anybody you want to bring in. You anything you want to do with it. Anything you want to do with it is you are liberty. It will help you to serve. But who is the ultimate owner of the? And the day you stop working in that company, what happens? They will collect the house. They collect the car because they don't belong to you. That is how it is with eternal life. The one that owns eternal life, that is eternal life in Jesus. The Bible says that God has given eternal life to his son. So when you receive Jesus Christ, when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive eternal life. And that is why when you backslide and turn the other way, you are going to lose it. It is at the end of the journey in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 22. Because if you read uh, Genesis chapter 2, you remember that there was a tree of life in the midst of the garden, in the paradise. Okay? And when man sinned and ate the fruit that he was told not to eat, and God said, let's keep him out, lest he eat of that tree of life. That tree of life, Jesus, if you read Revelation chapter 1, I think, um, verse 8, 9, 10, it tells you, as many as overcome, he will give them to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise. Say Revelation 2, 7, 8. He that have ear and ear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the churches. To him that overcome it, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Then you will eat it by yourself. Is that clear? Is that clear? Okay. It is because of this that you are not the custodian of this life, eternal life, is in Christ. That is why you need to depend on him. John chapter 15 verse 5. He says... I am the vine, you are the branch. So the branch must be vitally connected to the vine. And so when you are connected to the vine, that life, that eternal life that is in the vine flows into the branch and sustains it. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abided in me and I in him, the same bringeth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. 
So how do you abide in the vine? How do you maintain abide, abiding? How do you maintain a constant dwelling in the vine? It is by partaking of the bread, the body of Jesus Christ, and drinking of his blood. That is why he said in John chapter 6, verse 54, 53 and 54, he said, Except you eat my flesh, you drink my blood, you don't have that life in you. But he said, Who so eat it? The word eat it means eat is a continuous tense. So the more you continue to eat, as often as you eat it, that life flows through you. It refreshes you. It rejuvenates you. It makes you look younger than your age. It refreshes you. you it renews your youth. Number three, it is a vehicle, one of the major vehicles of imposing blessings of God upon your life. Okay, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, he's talking about the body of Christ, the cup, the blood, is a source, a channel to transfer blessings upon you. And I want to say, you know, the things of God are not, if you are not careful, the things of God, the way it goes, the way it flows, the way it happens, is precept by precept, line upon line. It's in the book of Mark, the Bible says, when you plant a corn, a man goes to the farm and plants corn, okay? And then you put water, put manure. You don't go there every day and be looking at it and see whether it's growing or not growing, whether it has come out or not come out. You don't do so. So the rain will fall, the sun will come, you go home and you sleep, you come back the first day, clean the farm, just walk around, you don't see anything happening. You look even, and then on after, if you plant the corn today, the next day you come, you look at the corn, there is nothing on the ground there, everything is still, or, you know, covered. Then the second day you come, you don't see anything. Then the third day you come, uh, you see something coming out from the ground, true or false. And then the next day again, the thing comes out openly. Then after some time, he started developing leaves. Then before you know what is happening, the thing has grown. And then you see the corn, and the corn by the side of the stalk. And then after some time, the thing is ripe. And then the Bible says you put in the sickle and the harvest. You don't see the, when the baby is growing in the womb, you don't see it. It's just that after nine months, you just see a full-blown baby come out. So you don't see it. So when you begin to obey the principles of God and keep doing it, you don't see it. most of the time. You look at it, you don't see nothing is happening. To your own naked eyes, nothing is going on. And so if you don't understand it, you will get disappointed. Because you have to understand the ways of the Spirit. It's the same way when you pray for somebody, lay hands on them. Anyway, when we come to the laying on of hands and all of that. So we need to get into the real thing. That's what happens. That's why it happens. So a lot of us, we start doing something, we start doing something and all of that. And expect that after one week, after one month, after two months or six months, when you plant corn, how long does it take for you to harvest it? Six months. It's three months. When you plant palm tree, how long does it take for you to harvest it? Yeah? Years. When you begin to harvest it, when it finally comes to fruition and you begin to harvest it, how long do you harvest it? How long do you harvest from palm tree? It's for life. What about cocoa? For life. But they take time to mature. But once they mature, the harvest is for life. But corn is three months. You harvest it. And those ones that come so often, that are everywhere, they are short-lived. The ones that endure forever, that endure for life, they are few and they take a lot of time. And that is actually where God wants to get you to. But what we want is today, today. Let it arrive today. 
Let it plant today, grow tomorrow, ripe the next day, we harvest it. And we eat, and that is all. And then you are back to square one. But God wants you to plant the one that will plant your food harvest and reap it forever. And as long as life remains, as long as the earth remains, you keep reaping it. That is what happens when you grow deep in Christ. And that is where He wants you to. Give me Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. For the perfecting of the self, for the work of the ministry, for the defining of the body of Christ, verse 13. Till we all come into in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, is where he wants to bring you. And it's possible, it's a possibility, it's possible, it's doable, it's achievable. It has been achieved. You are not the first person that will be there. So, I'm uh, giving you the four basic stages of your getting into the membership of the family of God. You get born again, you get baptized in water, you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get to partake of the communion on a regular basis. When you do this, when you do this, you become a member and I've told you why, what happens at new birth, what happens at water baptism, what happens at Holy Ghost baptism, and what happens at the communion table. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, he says, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, he says, For which cause we faint not, we don't faint. Though our outward man perish, he gets weak. He said, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The inward man, how does the inward man get renewed? Through fellowship, through drawing the life, drawing from the life of Christ. As you are drawing from it, he said you will not faint. You will not grow weary. You will not grow weak. You will not grow tired. You will not buckle down. Like every other strength is from God. When you talk about inner strength, that's how it comes. Inner strength comes when you maintain a fellowship with Him. And as you maintain fellowship, how do you maintain that fellowship? How do you maintain fellowship? Holy communion. When you partake of the bread and the word of the blood of Jesus Christ, you are maintaining fellowship with Him. When you study the word of God, the word of God. Jesus said, the word that I speak to you are spirit and life. When you study it, not just reading it, when you study it and then meditate on it, that, that word flows into you. You maintain fellowship. When you worship, when you worship, when you worship, when you praise, you maintain fellowship. The life of the spirit flows from within you. When we meet together like we are meeting now, the Bible says, they that appear in Zion, they grow from strength to strength, the strength of God. There is a fellowship that goes on in the, in the, when the body of Jesus, like when the Christian, when the brethren, when we come together to fellowship, God commands his blessing and even life forevermore. The very life of God. That is why he said, do not forsake the assembling of the brethren as it is in the manner of some. A lot of people, we think that coming to church is just to, to add to the number. To, you don't know that you are losing out. You are losing out. You are losing. You are the one losing. After one month, two months, three months, six months, you will find out that you are losing. Okay, having said this, then we move to the next. I, I want to marry the three together. The nature of God's word, the effect of God's word, understanding prayer and prayer. I want to put them together. You have your booklets. Because so what I'm doing is that I'm doing a further explanation and insight to help you to understand every single thing that we are doing. Is that clear? Listen very carefully. What I'm going to say in this area is of utmost so that you can see where you are failing, where you are not getting it. When you come to the word of God, when you come to the word of God, 
as powerful as God's word is, as effective as God's word is, he says, the word of God is quick, is powerful, is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces through the dividing asunder of the spirit and the soul. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. Even though it is like that, the, that same word of God will be ineffective when you wrongly apply it. I hope you don't get offended. I hope, I hope you don't get offended when I say what I want to say. You just use it and learn. And we are teaching. When you want to make prayer, you know, I told you before, a man he by name, Kenneth Hagin, I read in his book, he says, for 35 years, he has been ministry. He has never made one prayer that God did not answer. How many prayers have you made that God answered? And the, one, the one that he didn't answer and the more than the one that you so when somebody like that speaks, you better listen. And I have observed even in the church here, I have observed our prayers, the prayer that we pray, both the general prayer, the general, I have listened, I observed your prayers and all of that. I found that I said, no wonder it is like that. I'm trying to get you to see is a very big problem because you feel offended. And sometimes when I finish, you come, you ask me, what did I do wrong? You come again every time you are finding fault with me. Why did you, which one is this again? Okay, let me hear what you have to say. When you have that kind of attitude, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, because I will hasten my word to do what? Whose word? Whose word? What is prayer? Prayer is coming to God, coming to God on the basis of his word. Prayer is your coming to God on the basis of the word. The person that will understand this thing faster and better, though everybody has access anyway, is those of them who are practicing, I mean good lawyers, like um, Pastor John. You know when you come to, when you get to the court, hmm, what you are going to be telling the court, or what you are going to be telling the judge, what you are going to be telling the jury, it is not cock and bull story. You come on the basis of uh, the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. This Bible you are carrying is a legal document. It's a legal document. When the lawyer comes to the jury, you said, according to section five subsection so so and so of the federal republic of nigeria it is written in books you will be telling him your experience the experience you may have to tell him is maybe there is a judgment from a higher court maybe an appeal court or supreme court and all of that you refer to it because and that judgment was based on the constitution two of us so everything that you are doing is on the basis of the constitution that's why you go to God on the basis of his word. Now, wait. Because that is where you flow it a lot. 90% of the mistake and of, of the whatever you do, this is where it comes. When you go and quote the wrong constitution, when you go and quote the wrong one, like we do it a lot here, that is, is, you, is part and part. That is what we do every time. You quote one scripture that has nothing to do with what the subject is. And I've told you, when you ask the wrong question, you will get the wrong answer. 
and we forget that you are talking to an intelligent God. When you were a baby, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. When I was a baby, verse 11. When I was a child, I speak as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. God understands. Hello, those of you who have children, when they are small, you know, he will want he will want water. He will want water and he will start crying. Or he's hungry and he will start crying. Is it not? What do you do? You will know you because you are the parent, you know that if he's hungry, you give him food. And sometimes he's crying is because he wants to sleep. Is it not? What has crying got to do with sleep? What has hunger? Or crying got to do with hunger. Nothing. But you have that understanding. But when that child grows up, maybe now he is 12, and then he wants to eat food and he starts crying, what do you do? What do you do? Eh? You beat him. What kind of nonsense is this? When I was a child, I behaved like a child. My parents understood. What do I do? But a lot of us don't want to put it away. We still behave like children when we come into the presence. You open the Bible, go to one thing that has nothing to do with what we are praying. That is why Kenny Hagin says, When I have, what I do is that when I have a challenge, when I have a need, he doesn't rush. What he does is that he goes back and brings out his Bible and he will go to and find out what God says concerning his situation. And then when he finds it out, on the basis of that, he brings it before God. And you cannot do that without the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that leads you. I've given you a very good example about my own case. How that I needed a house so that I can move my family. I was putting, what was I doing? Putting scriptures. Running my mouth, putting scriptures. That I and my people whom God has given me are for signs and wonders. What has it got to do with the house? That's what we do. So it was when I pray in the spirit, I was praying in the spirit, I prayed in the spirit, and I finished praying in the spirit, I now rested. Then the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit now told me to go and use this scripture and pray. So I now come and said, as it is written, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That is what God said. On the, on the basis of his word, I stood on it and I do what he said I should do. It wasn't wrong. The answer came. I hear you. I hear you a lot here. Sometimes I'm just confused. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to pray. Let's pray for the service. We're going to Psalm 28. As the deer pants after the water, so my soul pants after the water. What has the deer panting after the water got to do with the service? And when you are doing that, see, if you are going to function in the altar, if you are going to function in the presence of God and all of you, you know what you do? You cannot afford to be a casual Christian. You think, and that is the reason why our prayer, we don't have the attitude of prayer. When you, before you pray, before you engage in fellowship, in prayer and all of that, you would have sat down and had the meditation. You rub your mind with God, reflect on a whole lot of things and all of that. And then there is going to be a download. The Holy Spirit leads you in the prayer that you want to pray. And he gives you the topic on what to pray, the scriptures. And on the basis of, you don't just go and open your bag, open your whatever, I say, um, no. You pray according to the promises that God has given to us. Amen. There are two things. You cannot bless somebody that is cursed. The blessing will not work. Neither can you curse the person that is blessed. The curse will not work. 
I'm showing you the different areas and different ways why prayers are ineffective, why it's not working. Somebody that is carrying a curse, you know what curse? What did I say that curse does? It prevents the blessings from the blessings are coming, but it can't get to you. There is a curse, and when you are bringing a curse to someone that is blessed, that doesn't have any because curse, curseness cannot come. So when you want to curse somebody that is, that is exactly what happened to Bala. When you wanted to curse the children of Israel, they are already blessed. You end up blessing them. But if you do the opposite, the reverse, when you want to bless somebody that is cursed, the, the blessing will not come. That is why sometimes he says, lay hands suddenly on But we go about laying hands. So when you lay hands, it's not going to happen. When you pray, it's not going to happen. What projects, what releases the word of God is faith. It is faith that is the trigger. When you pull the trigger, it goes. But that trigger you pull, that faith, that word you are speaking, that prayer you are making on that person or for that people and all of that, must be a prayer. You, God must lead you to the kind of prayer. If you are praying for blessing upon a people that God is bringing judgment on, it's not going to work. So that we can make an effective prayer. The Bible says the fervent effectual prayer of the right. Look at Daniel. It is in the course of studying the Bible, searching the scripture. He came across where it was said that the children of Israel were going to be 70 years in captivity in Babylon. And he counted the number of years, and it was complete. It's even over. So he went to God to begin to pray, led by the Spirit of God. What is intercession? What is the meaning of intercession in the Bible? I want you to go and check. Read God, go to. Intercession is needed whenever there is a judgment. God has brought judgment upon a people or upon a person. Then you come as an intercessor to intervene so that God will have mercy. You look at the intercession of uh, Abraham over Sodom and Gomorrah because there was a judgment already coming. And so he stood in the gap to intercede. In that second Chronicle chapter 7 verse 14 that we always read, the Bible says, when because of sin, when I shut the heaven, there is no rain. When I brought pestilence upon the people, that's judgment. If the people that are called by my name will come, that is intercession. To plead for mercy. You don't come to intercession and you are, you are binding Satan and you are cursing and you are shouting on top of your voice and all of that. No. When you come for intercession, look at the one of Daniel. It was intercession because the people see and that was the judgment of God. So he began to intercede and pray and ask God for forgiveness. But you see, that is why whenever you want to pray, whatever, you are going to be led by the Spirit. So if you are not the type that prays in the Spirit, the more you pray in the Spirit, the more your spirit man is, is very sensitive. The Holy Spirit flows, He speaks to you. Not in terms of languages or hearing voices and all of that. You will have a witness in your heart. It will be dropping. Your mind becomes like the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. So the thoughts and all of that will be flowing. It will be showing, telling you things. You will be writing it. If you are the type that prays in the spirit alone. So that is why if you are a child of God, you are born again, and you have not baptized in the Holy Spirit, I wonder what you are doing as a Christian. And even if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and you are tongues and you pray in tongues once in a while, I wonder what you think you are doing. You are not going to amount to anything. You will be frustrated. And one of the most frustrating aspects of the whole thing that I can't understand is that everything that pertains to life and godliness, he has made it available. Everything. God wants you to be a champion. God wants you to be the custodian of his glory and his power. God wants to showcase you, each and every one of you here, more than you want. That's why he went out of his way, out of the way. You see what he did? He did the unthinkable. All these things, he did it for us. They are available. You don't need to know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody in order to do it. 
is available. They caught and they caught it on the altar of the temple where he gave a thorn from the top to bottom. And the Bible said that everybody has access to the Holy of Holies. You don't need anybody to connect you. You don't need anybody to influence you. You as a person, what we are doing as ministers and all of that is to show you this truth and to not to obscure the cross. Because what many of us do is that we stand on the, we stand, this is the cross, we stand, so that people will be seeing us. That is wrong. My job is to show you, so that you know you can go there by yourself. You can get it. And some of you are more anointed than myself. That I am speaking here does not make me better than you. I hope you know that. I hope you know that. I think you, you may not know. You may not believe it. Some of you here are even more anointed than myself. No, because you are looking for somebody that you are always follow, you are follow, follow, follow. Go there yourself. How many of you have access to the presence of God? How many? Even some of you have had a dream in the past, I don't know that how there were chaos everywhere. But you come here, you won't notice nothing. Nothing will happen to you. And you finish service and all of that, you go anytime, even if it's by 12 o'clock, nothing will happen to you. I'm not saying it so that you'll be happy. I'm telling you the truth. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. That is why we don't want to pollute this. That's why God wants us to raise an army for him. Men who will stand their ground. Your word will carry power. When you open your mouth to speak, heaven hears. What will make it happen is what I am telling you. When you want to pray, pray the promises. Don't pray the problems. Pray the promises. Don't pray the problems. Oh Lord, I've been in this situation for long. How long, oh God? How long? I know that Abraham will definitely find us. We might only be 25 years. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in the prayer that you want to pray. As many as are led by the Spirit to pray. So if I am sick now, for example, don't think you know it. Don't think you know the scripture. Don't think you already know whatever. You know what you, you know anytime you're sick, you know what you put. By his stripes I have been healed. Then after putting by his stripes, have you have you been healed? You see, go to the hospital and take bed. Allow the Holy Spirit to give you the scripture to pray with. That is praying in line with the will of God. You remember 1 John 5 14? Whatsoever I ask in accordance to his will, he hears me. So, the word with which you are coming to give to him, is it the right? Um, in the court, where is there a situation where the lawyer will put the wrong whatever and the judge will tell him what it is like this but that is not what this says does it happen like that in the court is there a situation where the lawyer will put the wrong section of the law that does not really apply yes I say sometimes they put they will tell you that and then the other lawyer will stand up and say no objection it is not like that. Objection, my Lord. It is not like this. It is like this. Yeah, this one does not apply in this case. That it is the other way. It's a legal document. The fervent, effectual prayer. You know what we call fervent, effectual prayer? I will not agree, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I will not agree again. Satan is enough. <laughs> fervent, effectual prayer of the right. <laughs> Whether you agree or not agree. <laughs> Just lifting scriptures, lifting scriptures, and quoting. 
it is by sitting down and for example we want to pray service is starting we want to pray for the service don't pray for souls you know some of these things that we pray lord let us pray that god will quicken their footsteps so that they will be in church of that chapter what verse what the bible says when we come together in his name he is there in their midst we believe that he is here and because he is here we acknowledge him and we welcome him and we tell him it is a great privilege and honor to have him in our midst and we are counted worthy to be here it's not by our might or by power it is all because of him it's a great honor we thank you we worship you. Yes, Lord. We let you have your way in this meeting. Do that which you have proposed to do even before the foundation of the earth. Because what we are doing now, this gathering today, is not is being written. We are just fulfilling it. So the intention of this meeting, let it be accomplished, let it be fulfilled. Whatever is going to interfere with the the plan and purposes of God for this meeting. We steer their hand away. We clear them from the way. And we declare, open the heavens. Let the reign of your power and your spirit be visible in this place. Let not one person leave this place the same as he came. Speak to each and every one of us. Bring your word clear with clarity. Write them in the fi- with the finger of your spirit. In every fleshy heart here, Lord, Grant that all trust be given to those who stand to speak on your behalf. That as they speak, it will not be them that are speaking, but the Spirit of God is speaking to them. Abba. Is it not a good prayer for the service? And then people lift up their voice and begin to pray. Just go ahead and pray in the Spirit. You are praying in the Spirit. Because in His presence there is life forever. And so you will. You can proclaim it, you can prophesy, you can speak it, you can declare it. You have done a good work and you have prayed. Because that is how you get the job done. And then when we start singing, you know, I listen to so many things that people, you know what we do, eh? We come here, we entertain, not really here anyway. I listen to a whole lot of songs. There is one they played in, in, in my house. Somebody that was doing birthday, I heard the song. They were playing the song. He, he, he will start one song. In less than 10 minutes, he has played another, he has sang another one. In less than 10 seconds, he has sang another one. In, in a minute, he has sang about. Do you know that you can stand here? You will sing just one song, just one praise song, just one worship song. Because we are not when you stand here, we just get carried in. It's not entertainment. I'm not interested in your entertainment. Though. I'm not interested. When you start all this, you are jamboree and the entertainment. I switch off. And God is just, I'm just having patience. I'm just having patience. And my thought process is that we are online. If I woke up here now and tell you to go and sit down. They are watching. You have to come in the... God is awesome. When you step into the presence of God, in the Old Testament, I know we're not... In the Old Testament, the high priest will be so terrified and petrified. Be very careful. You will be afraid that he was going to die if he made one mistake. But in the New Testament, we're not afraid. Because the grace of God to enable us to worship God is available. Anytime you stand here, stand in the consciousness of the Father. You are standing in the presence of the Almighty God. Then He said, They that come near me, you must know that I am God. When you are singing a song, you sing a song and you know, and you, know you have connected. You know you've connected to the spirit, to the heavens. You let the 
people. He led the people. Let them worship in that song. Let them worship in that song. Sometimes you don't have it. You just close your mouth. You just remove your whatever. You see the voice with one accord. Just one song. Quiet, gentle. Let the people lift up their voice with one accord. It can be one song. It can be two. It can be three. As your legs. But not jumping from one song to another 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 song. I'm not saying you don't jump to another song. Don't get me wrong. Because you see, we are not good drivers, Christians. You move them to the right now, they will stay on the right. Hello. Hello. You know, eh, if you are singing a song, as you are singing a song, there is, if, the, if it is the Holy Spirit, another song after that will be coming on. Have you noticed? You believe me? So flow that way. Flow that way. And when that one is coming to an end, another one comes up. Another one, and anything that is of the spirit, when it comes, you will not, you won't have any problem. You will, everything will blend. When it is in the flesh, you will notice. I know you may not know, but I know. I've been doing this thing for more than twenty-five years. I have little experience, so that is the reason why sometimes. So why I'm saying this is so that I have been to churches, I have watched, I have seen. It's entertainment. The greatest thing that God has given to you is this book. Read it. Study it. If you don't know what, if you have a prayer point, a prayer need, if you have a need and you don't know what to do, ask. There is a prayer of supplication. It's different from prayer of intercession. There is a prayer of agreement. It's different from a prayer of faith. Corporate prayer is different from individual prayer. There is a prayer you pray to God directly. There is a prayer you don't pray to God. Hello? There is a prayer you pray to God, and there is one you don't pray to God. Which one you don't pray to God? He said, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed. He didn't say, Whosoever shall say to God concerning this mountain. When I want to address mountains, what I do, is that I will just go to God first and worship God and bless God and thank Him and I thank Him and I worship Him and I bless Him and I offer thanksgiving and all of that. Maybe a sickness on my body as a mountain, as a mountain. I will worship God, I will thank God, I will bless God, I will exalt Him, I will do all that. When I finish, I will turn to the mountain. What are you doing? Sent you or you're out in Jesus' name. Amen. Get out. Oh, Father, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, there is pain here. Lord, heal my pain in the leg. No. What did I say? No. What I'm telling you is a so because in the book of John 15, Jesus was saying. On that day, I did not say you should pray to the Father or that I should pray for you to the Father. But whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it. And some of us, you have you have um, you have all forgiveness in your heart. Somebody has offended you, somebody has hurt you, somebody has dealt, done something bad to you, and you are hurting on forgiveness, and then you go to God. He will not answer your prayer. He will not hear your prayer. No matter what it is. If if you are hurting, if you are hurting as a result of what somebody did to you and all of that, and it's so painful, go to God. Ask him for the grace to help you. Because without him, you can do nothing. Ask him for the grace to help you to let go. Tell him the way it is. Lord, someone did this to me is painful in my heart and I want to let go because you said I should let go. It's painful. Help me, Lord. Bring that healing. Give me the grace to be able to forgive and just, not just to forgive, but to forget. Go to him and tell him about it. The grace to forgive and when, when you pray that prayer, another way you pray, when you finish, you begin to pray for that person. Bless that person that has hurt you. 
When you do that, the next thing is that that burden and all of that will be lifted. When you finally see that person, you will just fall in love with it. You will know that that thing. You know how you know that you have forgiven the person and it's not in your heart. When you finally see that person, if you have not forgiven that person, when you see that person, something inside of you dies. Or when you think about that person, inside of you, something dies. You know that thing is still there. It is there. And it will hinder your prayer. Your prayer will not cross the sea. That's why you don't have a... That's why Jesus Christ... They ask, Peter asked Jesus Christ, how many times will my brother sin against me and I will forgive him? He said 70 times 7. In other words, 490 times in a day. Is it possible for somebody to offend you for 490 times? Is it possible? So what he's saying in effect is that as long as they offend you, forgive. As long as it is within your power, forgive. And when you forgive, you are on top of that person, but you don't know. When you forgive, you are stronger than that. You are better than that person. Because unforgiveness will bring you down. And you will not have access to God. Jesus said unto him, I say unto thee, Mark 11, 23, For verily I say unto you, and whosoever shall say unto this mountain, have you seen it? He didn't say, whosoever shall say to God, whosoever shall say to this mountain, mountain is not talking about physical mountain, some group of spirits, few brethren gathered together through life story. They said they wanted to exercise their faith that God, the spirit of God is too much. Their faith is, they saw, they went to where a, a water tank, the position of this water tank is not good. It must go. They joined their hand and closed their eyes. Say this mountain must move. Through life story. They close their eyes and began to pray. And they pray and pray and pray. When they open their eyes, they see saw the tank. They close their eyes again and began to pray. Say, Satan, you are a liar. You must go. So when they have prayed one hour, one hour, two hours, they started living one by one. When this one opened his eyes and saw the tank, he will disconnect his leave. The other one say, you don't have faith. And they continue. And they prayed again. Opened their eyes, the tank was still there. And then they believe you one by one. As they are looking at the tank, the tank refers to the mountain. That's what they call the mountain. Mountain speaks about problems. Mountain speaks about challenges in your life. Mountain speaks of difficult things or difficult times. However, when you pray for mountain, sometimes God allows that mountain to stay for a reason. And the reason why He's staying is that He wants to use it to build you up. But in order to make sure that Satan is out of the equation, in order to make sure that there is no problem between you and the mountain and all of that, to make sure that if it is God, so let God be. If it is God's will, let it be. But for me to know that it is the will of God, how I know is that I will make sure that in my own heart, I don't have any unforgiveness in my heart. And I know that I'm praying in line with the word of God. And then I will call that mountain to go. After, because what I do, I worship God and bless God and do all that. And then after that, I will now face the mountain. I will address that mountain. Just like it happened in the case of Paul. There was a thorn in his flesh. So he went to pray and all of that. And then when he prayed, God now said, no, I am the one behind it. I allowed it for a reason. So that is when he now said, when I am weak, I am strong. Because it is in my weakness that the power of God is. God is saying, when you are, my power is made manifest when you are weak. So acknowledge that you are weak. You see my power and all of that. God uses it to teach him something. That's what we are learning today. That's what we are practicing. So in your own case, the same thing is not everything that you can. There are some that God wants to use to train you, but you are resisting it. And you, you know how many times you have bound God and bound the Holy Spirit and cast him out. So that is why you have to be in the spirit. It's not everything. Fire, 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 fire. You just keep praying. No pray with knowledge. Pray with understanding. And he said, and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe those things which he said shall come to pass. Let me say this. Uh, you know why you pray with that on the let me let me show you something. I'm sure it will help somebody. If I tell you now 
that I'm coming to your house. If I tell you now that I'm coming to your house tomorrow, you know you, as you are going home, you will remember it. You'll be thinking about it. You'll be looking forward for me coming. Two of us. Two of us. Now, is it possible for me to tell you that I'm coming and you forget that I say that I'm coming? Is it possible? So you will not be expecting me. You will even be, you will even not be at home. You see these two outcomes. One is what faith is. The other is what faith is not. If you have a relationship with Jesus, when I tell him about something, when I pray about something, hmm, I'm always living in the consciousness of that prayer. I remember I talked to him about it. And I, I'll keep remind, I keep saying, Father, I thank you for that. I keep thanking God. You are looking forward to it. You have faith. That is how you faith extend that. That's how you express your faith. But when you pray about it, sometimes or most times when you pray about it, you have even forgotten that you pray. And then the next thing that is you are worrying. But when I pray about something, when I make a promise to you, I remember that I make a promise to you, and I'll keep it in mind. And I'll keep remembering it. So when I make a promise to God, when I pray to God and all of that, I'll keep remembering, I pray to God, I ask him about this, and I'm looking forward to the answer. And the expectations of the righteous shall not do what? Because I'm expecting it. The Bible said concerning that uh, cripple, and Peter said, look on us. And the Bible said that the man looked upon Peter and John, expecting to receive. Expectation is the key to manifestation. So when you pray, I am looking forward to that prayer that I made. Having prayed that prayer in line with God, I am looking forward. Look at what Abraham did. Not being weak in faith and all that, but continually giving praise and thanks to God. He remembers it. He keeps thanking God. You know, that is one thing about the Yoruba. When you do something for them, for the next one month, you won't rest. When they see you tomorrow and say, thank you for yesterday. When they see you two days later, they say, thank you for the other day. When they see you one week later, they say, thank you for that week, for that day. When they see you a month later, they will say, thank you for that month. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's good. But if it's an evil man, that means, thank you very much. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Case closed. If he sees you tomorrow, he's on a fresh note. He doesn't even remember what he said. Amen. Tomorrow, we are going to start repentance from the works and faith towards God. From today, when you want to pray, don't be in a hurry. Kinehagi said, if he has a need, sometimes it takes him one week to pray about it. It's not that day again. He said, sometimes it takes him one week. Because he will settle down, find out the will of God for that. There is a difference between the word of God and the will of God. They are not the same. If you want to go a step further, you are interested in the will of God. And that's what makes the difference. The one that is interested in the word is just quoting the word of God, quoting the word, quoting the word. But the one that is interested in the will is not in a hurry. You want to find out what the will of God is in this matter. And the Holy Spirit will lead you to a scripture. And when he leads you to that scripture, that is what God is speaking. You use it. And then you pray, you can go to sleep. It will surely come to pass. It will surely come to pass. Amen. Amen. The greatest gift that God has given us is a gift to come into his presence. To make a position. Even praying for souls. There are souls that are not supposed to pray for. That people are not supposed to pray for. Even Jesus in his intercessory prayer, John chapter 17, he said, I pray not for this world. Have you seen it? Haven't you seen it? Oh, yeah, give me. Let's, let me give the last scripture. John chapter 17, verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. Verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. 
there are those of them God has given you. Pray for them. If they are not, they pray. Lord, I am praying for those of them that you have. God, Paul said, God sent him to who? To the Gentiles. And he sent Peter to who? To the Jews. Paul cannot be praying for the Jews. That any time, go read in the Acts of Apostles, any time he began to go to the Jewish nation and all of that, that's when he received the greatest beating of his life. Because God didn't send him. All the troubles and all of that he has encountered was with the Jews. He was sent to the Gentiles. And so your prayer must be directed to the Gentiles and not to the Jews. If you read uh, Romans chapter 9, he said, my heart burns and all of that. I wish that my own brethren are accursed and all of that. He was frustrated. And God didn't hear that prayer. Find out the people that you are sent to. Go for them. You know when we started and all of that, my wife, we started a whole lot. We started with the women who were, if you come there, the whole place was jump out. And then when we finally started, we started um, the BTS. We actually, the name of the, our Sunday service is Beyond the Surface and all of that. So they hijacked it and allowed, allowed it and all of that. And so they, they started BTS and all of that. And then the women, they were coming and all of that, and we are here. And we've been praying, Lord, that these women will start coming here. That these men, we call them forth in the name of Jesus. We call them from the north. We call them from the south. We call them from the east and from the west. And the west. Let them begin to come. Because you say we shall decree a thing, put it by. You see what you mean by put it by? God didn't send us to them. Told me, I'm sending you to the town and the arms. People come here, your message will change. They will give you one black jeep, give you another one, give you another one. Your message will change. Pray in line with that. Find out what we are doing here. This is the kind of people that God sent us to reach the youth, the down, and the out, the hopeless. see results. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. When we do the maturity class, we're going to see, but we're going to be dealing about how to be led by the Holy Spirit, how to know the will of God. They are, they are, they are the deeper thing, they are not in the shadow. Amen. Eternal Father, what else shall we say to you? But thank you. We thank you from the depth of our heart for every man, every woman that is under this roof today. Lord, you have begun that journey with them. You are the one faithful. Your name is faithful. You will perfect everything that concerns them. Though we fall, we will rise up seven times. They will come at us from the right. They will come from the left. They will come from front and behind and every direction. But you will deliver each and every one. And you will cause our feet to stand on the rock. I pray from my heart, Lord, concerning what you are doing in the life of these ones. I pray that each and every one of them will be rooted and grounded and then be established in Christ. And they will be rooted, and your grace and your power will be visible in their lives. Lord, you go ahead of them, ahead of each and every one of them. The battles of God that they are going to fight, fight it on their behalf. Let the doors that have been closed over the years be opened. Grant them access into their eternal inheritance. Cause them to know you. Reveal yourself to them. Reveal Jesus Christ in them. In the name of Jesus Christ. Cause them to walk in your way. Put the hunger and the delight to delight in you. Because no one can come to you except you draw him, my father. Draw this one by yourself, by your spirit, Lord. Establish the works of your hand. Establish the call of, of, of the call of God upon their life. Establish them in the ways of the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. When they stand to minister, when they stand to speak, your hand will be upon them. And 
men will know that these are men you have trained by yourself, singled out by yourself, prepared for the coming time and season in the name of Jesus. I bring the chariots of fire of God over your life, over your household, over your family, over the works of your hand, over your businesses, over your career. In the name of Jesus, they will come in one way, but they will flee in seven ways. In the name of Jesus, many are the affliction of the righteous, but God will deliver you one after the other, and you will stand on top at the end of the day, and you will declare that indeed you are more than conquerors. Thank you, Heavenly Father. May your face continue to shine on them. Glory be to your name. Glory be to your name. I bless them with the blessings of God. I bless them with the wisdom of God. Father, he said, those of them that fear you, you will teach them the doctrine. May they know your ways. May they reveal, reveal your word to them, Lord. Let your word be so mighty in their heart and in their mouth. In the name of Jesus. That when they start speaking, your power and your glory will be made manifest. And they will become a vessel through which you declare your power and your glory to the dying world. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Glory be to your name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And amen. God bless you.